there's a lot going on in our, our world and in our nation that has a lot of people who call themselves Christians very concerned, very worried about what might happen, not, not only just what has happened, but what might happen down the road. And certainly, as Christians, we can observe the events that are taking place uh, in Europe, and we can see the, some of the political issues and societal issues that we have even here in our own country. And we can uh, recognize that there are some things we need to be prepared for, recognize that we have to continue to be faithful unto the Lord, be prepared for whatever may come as a result of that. And if it means being persecuted for that, then so be it. That's going to be true of any age, of any era, of any time for the last 2,000 years, much less uh, the times of, of God's people under the Old Testament as well. But when we consider the events that are unfolding and we consider what we're observing, it brings people to ask, is God still there? Is God still watching? Is God still in control? Does he even care anymore? And if he does, then why is he letting all of this happen? Well, obviously, we could talk quite a bit about God and free will of man, how that God lets man make his own choices, and that sinful choices are often not only to the detriment of ourselves, but to the detriment of others as well. Time and time again, the choices of others, particularly sinful choices, can hurt and harm others, sometimes entire countries' worth of people. But when we consider the power of the Lord, it's not really about God's power or God's ability. It's about God's willingness that ultimately people wonder about. And so when we ask that question, just as we sang about God's faithfulness, there's an allusion in that first verse to Malachi chapter 3, how that God changeth not. Well, that concept carries into, do I believe in God's faithfulness, in the faithfulness of the Lord. When we talk about faithfulness, what does faithfulness mean? Well, in our context of describing the faithfulness of a person as it relates to someone upon I rely, it's their ability or their reliability, their ability to be depended on, to be trusted. And really, when we go through occasions like this, even for the strongest of Christians, there's quite a bit of consternation and concern when viewing events. We're concerned maybe not so much for ourselves, but maybe for our children or our grandchildren, the type of society that they're going to be uh, living in and the type of society maybe our grandchildren one day might be raised in. How is that going to work? What's going to happen? How are they going to survive as Christians? Well, I'm sure every generation of Christian has probably at some time thought that about the succeeding generation or about the, the, the situations that were taking place in that particular decade or series of decades. What's it going to be like in 20 years? What's it going to be like in 50 years? But understand that when we talk about the faithfulness of the Lord, we are already describing not just the all-knowing of God, not just the all power of God, but his willingness to abide with those whom he deems as being his people. Those who he's going to take care of. Those he's going to watch over. And God's people, the world over, members of his son's body, the Lord, Lord's body. When we pray to the Lord, we often ask for strength to stand before those who may threaten us or those who may harm us. We often ask that God will watch over our land and our situation, that our leaders will make the wise decisions they need to make. Those are all things that we should be praying for as the New Testament bears out. But when we consider God's ability to bring about or to use what is brought about to his purpose, what we're talking about isn't just miracles. Remember, the definition of a miracle is the observable suspension of natural law. That's what a miracle is. It's something I observe that this is not natural. This is supernatural. 
But a lot of times when we talk about the faithfulness of God and God watching over his people, it's not necessarily with direct intervention of nature defying power. Instead, it's through providence. Now, providence is one of those broad concepts that we can define, but it's hard to put your finger on where exactly God's power is working in a set scenario. Definition of providence, is kind of a wide dictionary definition, is the exercise of foresight and care for the future. Okay, there's nothing necessarily miraculous about it, and it's that, that definition isn't even necessarily considering an all-powerful God. It's just the consideration of the future, of preparing for the future. But when you consider God's providence, it is the use of God's non-observable power and omniscience, his all-knowing, to ensure the care and growth of his people despite physically happy or unhappy circumstances that may occur. From Genesis all the way through Revelation, yes, there's examples of direct power and miraculous works being done. But there's also example after example of God's power being utilized in much more subtle ways. Thus, God's providence. And there are numerous examples in both the Old and New Testaments where God's providence, while not being clearly pointed to, say, this is where God intervened, or this is where God intervened, that's not how providence works. What the best you can say is, God was with that situation. Or God was with those people. For instance, the situation with Joseph. Joseph, through... No action specifically of God, no miracle that was done. In fact, through the jealous actions of his brothers, Joseph was sold into slavery. And then it was kind of a roller coaster from there, ultimately ending up Joseph in, in, uh, in Egypt, the right hand of Pharaoh. And there's a whole background of the famine that was to come that God warned Joseph about and about uh, to Pharaoh and Joseph was able to provide the interpretation, so Egypt was prepared for this famine to come. Well, Joseph's brothers came along. And in Genesis 45 and in verse 4, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers and talks a little bit about why this all happened. Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. So they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Verse 8, so now it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, technically and strictly speaking, Joseph is not correct. It was his brothers who sold him into slavery. Joseph knows that. But what Joseph is alluding to is the providence and foresight, the foreknowledge of God. That this was all done according to what God had planned. Did God make the brothers of Joseph sell them into slavery? No, they did that on their own. They were jealous and envious. Did God make Jacob treat Joseph and Benjamin differently? No, he didn't. But God knew that's how Jacob was going to react with, with Joseph and Benjamin. God knew how the other brothers were going to react to Joseph. They were going to sell him into slavery. And God, knowing what was to come, made sure everything that happened happened for the purpose of ultimately fulfilling the promise all the way back to Abraham. Keeping that family alive, preserving that family, and ultimately even leading down to them being led out of Egypt by Moses. But Joseph says, after Jacob dies in Genesis chapter 50 and in verse 20, the brothers of Joseph are very concerned. They're worried that now that Jacob, Jacob is dead, Joseph is going to reject his brothers. But here in verse 20, Joseph says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. 
Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph acknowledges that the brothers, they did, they meant evil for Joseph. They meant for him to be gone and to never return. But I mean, in Certainly imagine the impact that had on Jacob and how much he wept over thinking Joseph was dead. I mean, what the brothers did was evil. It wasn't just some, some April Fool's joke. This was serious. But what Joseph says is you meant it for evil, but God used your actions to bring about good. Now, there are certainly some instances of what you would call miraculous situations regarding the, the, uh, the, the visions or the dreams that were given and the interpretation of them and so forth. But in terms of how Joseph came to be in the position that he was, there is no direct miracle that you can point to and say, this is where God made this happen. Certainly Joseph's character was the key component in it. Joseph being full of integrity full of godly, godliness, making sure he was doing that which served God, even in the situation with Potiphar's wife. Through it all, God brought about good. We see the same thing with Esther and Mordecai. In Esther chapter 4, really God's providence is in this chapter, from chapter 1 through the end of the book. But when we look at Esther chapter 4 in particular, after Haman has kind of tricked the king into setting out this decree uh, that uh, basically the Jews would be destroyed. We find in verse verses seven and eight how that Mordecai he wants Esther to know about what's taking place. Esther responds in verse eleven, I, "I can't, I can't go to the king and I can't talk to him about this because if I do, I could be put to death." She explains in verse eleven. So in verse 12, a messenger comes and tells Mordecai about what Esther has said. And in verse 13 and 14, Mordecai says this. He told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. First of all, notice Mordecai's faith that if Esther does nothing, that's not going to change the fact that God's still going to rescue and keep his people. God's still going to take care of his people. Why? That goes all the way back to the promises to Abraham and everything since that point, all the way up into captivity. Mordecai was convinced that God's going to take care of us one way or the other. But think about this. Maybe, even though Esther does, or Mordecai doesn't put it in these words, maybe God has brought it about for you to be in the position you're in for this purpose so that you can save your people. But notice this isn't as much about God as it is about Esther. Are you going to do the right thing? God's still going to bring about salvation for his people. That's not, that's not up for debate. God's still going to do what is, needs to be done for his people to be saved. This is about you, Esther. Because if you do nothing, you're not going to be spared. But perhaps, maybe this is why you're in the position you're in. This is the way God's providence is often defined. Maybe this is why. Paul even uses the same type of language with Philemon over Onesimus about this slave that had escaped. He came to Rome, found Paul. Paul taught him, baptized him. Now he's sending Onesimus back to Philemon. And when he sends him back, he sends this letter, the letter of Philemon. And Paul says, perhaps this is why he left, so that he could return to you not only a slave, but also a brother. Well, Philemon didn't intend necessarily to leave to become a Christian. He could have done that there. That wasn't Philemon's intention, just as much as it wasn't the brothers of Joseph's intention for him to become the right hand of Pharaoh. But God brought that about. But not even Mordecai, or for that matter, Paul, can put their finger and define the providence of God. God didn't make them do this, but he knew they were going to do this and made allowances for it. 
What a great definition of providence to recognize that God's power is still going to look over his people regardless of what individual people do. And I want you to note that here from verse 14. Whether you do this or not isn't relevant to the greater salvation of the Jews. God is going to take care of his people one way or the other. But maybe this is why you're in the position you're in. We also see Paul. And two different occasions where God's providence is clearly seen and yet unclearly defined. In Acts chapter 23, after Paul's in prison, he's going to be sent to Caesarea. And what happens in Acts chapter 23, verses 11 on through verse 24, you have this situation where these men, these Jews, take an oath. And they have vowed not to eat until they have killed Paul. And so they're planning an ambush. And according to verse, verse 16 of Acts chapter 23, here's what Luke says happens. When Paul's sister's son, his, Paul's nephew, heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. And then, of course, Paul brought in uh, the centurion, had the nephew explain to the centurion what happened, and then they were able to avoid the ambush. One verse, how did that happen? How did Paul's nephew happen to be in the right place at the right time to overhear about this ambush? It is not unlike the situation with Mordecai overhearing about the assassination plot to kill the king in Esther. He happened to be in the right place at the right time, which ultimately led to Haman, the, uh, the, the bad guy in the situation of Esther, having to parade, parade Mordecai around the city, declaring him uh, to be uh, praiseworthy from the king because he rescued the king from an assassination attempt. Well, where did God send his power to bring that about? He didn't move the nephew like a pawn on a chessboard. He just happened to be in the right place at the right time. In Acts chapter 27 as Paul and Luke and those who are with them and the ship is, being, is, is heading towards Rome, but they're caught in a storm. And in verse 22, Paul, earlier, he says, you should have listened to me. We should not have gone on this voyage at this time. This was during the stormy weather time and they shouldn't have gone. And Paul says, you should have listened to me, but you didn't. Verse 22, he says, now I urge you to take heart. For there will be no loss of life among you. There were hundreds of people on this ship. And Paul says, well before the shipwreck, there's not going to be anybody who loses their life, but only the ship. Verse 23, for there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told to me. Notice that last statement from Paul. Paul says, I believe God that it will be just as God says it's going to be. We're going to lose the ship, but not a single person on this boat is going to die. Some of those individuals on that ship couldn't even swim. And yet, in a shipwreck, on the shoals, well off the shore, they were all spared. Verse 42, we see the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners. The centurion wanted to save Paul. So he said, nope, everybody, jump overboard, go to land. Verse 44, the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship, those who couldn't swim. And so it was, they all escaped safely to land. In fact, at one point, Paul even says, not a hair of any of your heads will be lost. And I would be willing to consider the fact that once they got on the shore, if you were to go and look, if you were able to actually count the hairs of the head before and after, that it was actually true. Not a single hair was lost. Imagine that. Now, where's the miracle? Where is the observable suspension of natural law in this event? There isn't any, not that we see, but where's the power of God? Oh, it's all over the place. It's there. That's why we call it the providence of God. His foreknowledge, 
his foresight, and his ability, however that is used, to bring about what he wants to happen regardless of what man decides to do. And that's a key component here. Because in Romans chapter 8 and in verse 28, there's a statement that gives all of us great comfort. Paul says in verse 28 of Romans 8, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Well, what are all things? There's a lot of bad things that happen in life. There's a lot of bad things that happen to good people. Sometimes it's life events, disease of some sort. Sometimes it's events that are brought on by the sins of another person. Wickedness and, and murder and so forth. Those are not good things. Those are not good events. But what does Paul say? He says, we know that all things, not all good things... All things work together for good to those who love God. Whether it's good or bad, happy or unhappy, encouraging or discouraging, joyous or sorrowful, whatever the event may be, whatever it is in life that happens, good can be brought from it. We especially see that in the character of the people of faith who are willing, despite the obstacles, despite the adversity, to remain faithful to the Lord. God brings good about for them. Does that mean everything's always going to be happy? No, it doesn't mean everything's always going to be happy. But it means that I am going to be, first of all, looking for the good that can be brought. Whether it's my example in the midst of hardship, maybe it's helping somebody else because I've gone through that. I'm able to lend my viewpoint in being faithful to the Lord for them to go through that situation. But what's so great about God's providence is that whatever we may think, this is why God allowed this to happen. This is why this happened. I guarantee you, you don't have the full picture. We can consider the applications for ourselves. How has this helped me? I lost my best friend on his 18th birthday. We were as close as brothers. We did everything together. On his 18th birthday, he was in a car accident. But it was that event that actually changed a lot for me. That wasn't a good thing that happened. And I can still remember every detail of that night. But what I can tell you is that what has come from it has affected me, but not just me. His older brother ended up being baptized after that. This is a family that were raised Catholic. Not only that, but since then, there have been so many aspects of that event that has affected not just me, but people that I would have never have thought would have been affected by it. You never know what can come from an event, whether it's something that you have no control over or it's your example that you never realize what kind of impact it can have. That's the providence of God. And you will never, at least not on this earth, ever see the full picture of it. How many people can be affected by our example of being a faithful Christian? You'll never know. But God does. This is how God brings about good for them who love the Lord. Even in the worst of circumstances, the most despicable or terrible actions that man can do to man, doesn't mean it's good, but good can come from it if we're willing to remain faithful. We see examples of, in the New Testament of people bearing out the faithfulness of the Lord. That over and over again, God is faithful. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, Paul, he describes the teaching of the gospel and his being thrown in prison. And notice what he says. I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually 
turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. You would think throwing an apostle who was an avid evangelist and teacher, throwing him into prison would have the opposite effect. You think, well, we'll kind of slow down the spread of the gospel. Paul says the things that have happened to me have actually turned out to further the gospel. Verse 13, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Verse 14, and most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident in my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. You would think it would have the opposite effect. That the Christians would be timid, that they'd be scared. Paul says that's not what happened for most of them. It actually had the opposite effect. Providence. There's no miracle there. It's providence. In James chapter 1 and in verse 2, James utters a ridiculous statement. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. It's ridiculous. Count it all joy when you fall into trials, in adversity, when you come across obstacles. But James explains why we should count it all joy. Why are we blessed when we go through trials? Knowing that the testing of your faith, verse 3, produces patience. That's why. We don't consider most of our obstacles and adversities and trials a blessing, particularly perhaps in the moment. But this is part of the reason why we have scriptures like Romans 8, 28, to remind us that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, even in trying times. This leads us to understand, like in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and in verse 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified, just as it is with you, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. Verse 3, But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. Notice how Paul says the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you. Now that's provided the brethren remain faithful, continue to grow and to mature. But God will bring this about. How? Is he going to zap them with some kind of power? Not necessarily. No, God doesn't have to do that. Providence, the growth from trials, the growth from maturing in God's word. God will establish them and guard them because he is faithful. He is always watching out for his people. He doesn't lose sight. He doesn't forget. He doesn't take a year or two off. He's still watching just as intently and involved just as intently as he was with Nebuchadnezzar all those many thousands of years ago with Daniel. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and in verse 21, Paul tells the Thessalonians to test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Verse 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, he who calls you is faithful who will also do it. What will he do? He will sanctify you completely, verse 22, or verse 23, and he will preserve you blameless if they continue in faith. God is faithful, and he will bring this about. Not only the, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but your preserving and sanctification as long as they remain faithful. Because God is faithful. God can be trusted. God can be relied upon. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and in verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you such as is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. In context, we're talking about temptation. 
But even trials and obstacles, as mentioned by James, present their own temptations. God will never allow you to be overloaded to the point that you literally cannot bear it. God will never let that happen. How? I don't know. His power, his providence, his wisdom, his knowledge. Toss a coin. I mean, God has all of those things at his disposal. And God uses those things to bring about good for his people when his, good or, or when his people are doing that which is good. In Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse 23, Hebrews 10 and in verse 23, the Hebrew writer says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. Well, what has he promised? He's promised a home in heaven. He's promised a resurrection from the dead one day, leading to, after judgment, a home in heaven for eternity with him and with Jesus and with all the saved. He who has made that promise is faithful. In Hebrews 11, he's going to refer to Sarah as having judged God faithful because he had the ability to do it. Through faith, she was able to, to bear Isaac and she gained strength because she proved him faithful. She uh, concluded him faithful. God is faithful. He can be trusted. He can be relied on. Which is why we now eagerly wait for the revelation of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and in verse 4. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 4. The final passage for you this morning. Paul says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 8, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God is faithful. To what end? To the end that they are eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. God's made a promise. Jesus Ruled the Father faithful. The Father had made a promise to him, and Jesus trusted in that promise to the point of the death of the cross, knowing he would be raised. Knowing, once again, he would have that glory he had before he came to earth, John chapter 17. Jesus remembered what that was like, and he looked forward to having that glory again. Now you and I, we eagerly wait for the revelation of Jesus Christ. For his return in the sky. So that then will come judgment and then will come a home in heaven. If we're faithful to him. But all that relies on us trusting and relying on God. Do you believe in the faithfulness of the Lord this morning? Are you willing to put your trust? Are you willing to rely and depend on him? Because he gives us all the answers we need. Everything that pertains to life and godliness is here and available to us. All we have to do is look, learn, and trust. Are you willing to eagerly wait the Lord's coming? Are you able to eagerly await the Lord's coming? Eagerly suggests that I want it to happen soon. Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 even says, hastening the coming of the Lord. If I'm not in a right state, if my soul's not right before God, I can't hasten the coming of the day of the Lord. I can't eagerly await for it. If you're not a Christian this morning, become a Christian. If you're convicted that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, understanding that baptism washes away our sins and adds us to the body of Christ, understanding that from that point on, we arise to walk a new creature, trusting in the Lord. You can do that this morning. And then you can eagerly await the coming of the Lord, whether he comes in five minutes or in 50 years. Makes no difference. 
those of us who are Christians. We're always bombarded with circumstances and situations that are constantly trying us. Whether it's things in our individual lives or situations, political, societal, whatever, that we observe around us. But this is not new. We aren't facing anything that faithful people haven't faced before. And the example we have of these faithful people is that they trusted in the Lord. They considered him faithful who has promised, knowing that he continues to rule in the kingdoms of men. That hasn't changed. Therefore, when we're tempted to ask the question, God, why are you letting this happen? Stop yourself. Because we have absolutely no idea what we're talking about. God does. He sees the big picture. You and I, we know nothing. And that's the lesson that Job learned. Don't question the wisdom of God because guess what? You and I weren't there when God created the earth. You and I weren't there when he established the foundations of the, of the oceans and the seas. When he created Leviathan and Behemoth. God was. God is allowing things to happen as he wants them to happen. You and I, here's the great thing about this. You and I, all we have to do is be faithful. We don't have to take on the, the burdens of society to fix things. That's not our job. Our job is to be faithful. And to let our light shine before men that others may be faithful too. If you're subject to the invitation this morning, come forward as we stand and sing.